Hey there folks, welcome to a bagpipe review for APUS history of chapters 36 and 37. So this is America in the post-World War II uh, world. So the beginning of the Cold War and a lot of social upheaval in the United States. So let's get going. So we're first going to tackle B, belief systems. Uh, there's going to be a lot in this category. First of all, you've got the Cold War going on between the United States and the USSR. What this is, it's a battle of ideas and beliefs. It's a battle of capitalism versus communism. It's a battle of democracy versus totalitarianism. And this is going to influence almost everything going on in the world during this time period. Um, and connected to this, you're going to have this red scare going on in the United States, this fear of neighbors, of the people you're passing by on the street, your government agent, uh, government people, being communist spies. Um, television is going to emerge as a powerhouse during this time uh, through advertising, influencing cultural choices, also the rise of televangelists spreading uh, religious beliefs. And of course you're going to have this promotion of nonconformity. This is reflected by groups like the Beats, not the Beatles, but the Beats, a group of writers and poets. Uh, things like rock and roll challenge the status quo. People like Elvis Presley dancing on TV, uh, with his suggestive dancing poses. Um, things like architecture are going to challenge, uh, challenge the way society has always viewed buildings. And then things like pop culture. So beyond music, but movies and literature, uh, poetry, uh, what people wear are going to challenge a lot of the traditional beliefs in the United States. So America in the world, this is a big category in the years following World War II. Uh, first of all, again, the Cold War with the United States for the USSR. This begins before World War II really even ends with the Yalta and Potsdam conferences. Uh, the USA, unlike what it did after World War I, where it kind of res uh, reverted to being an isolationist nation, they're going to go global, and we continue to be a global nation uh, to this day. Uh, we get involved in organizations like the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, the World Bank, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. These are organizations that we are still uh, the main leaders in, uh, and you still hear about in the news on a regular basis. Um, the United States is also going to get closer to Western Europe in order to challenge the power and influence of the USSR. We're going to do this through things like the Marshall Plan, the Truman Doctrine, the Berlin Airlift, and also enforcing a policy of containment of communism, trying to keep it from spreading physically and, uh, and metaphorically. Um, you're going to see more, uh, more military conflicts, uh, mainly based on uh, this battle, uh, mainly based on this battle between communism and uh, democracy uh, and capitalism. Um, the Korean War is going to be huge. And then, of course, the early stages of Vietnam are going to take place in the 1950s, where the United States is involved. It's going to be a very a drastic shift in Latin American involvement, uh, particularly in a country like Cuba, with the rise of leaders like Fidel Castro. And finally, the space race. Uh, the Soviets are going to be the first in space when they send their satellite Sputnik up. And this is going to drive the United States to really put a lot of money and time and energy into our own space program. Uh, in the lower right hand corner you have a model of Sputnik, that little satellite that puts so much fear into Americans at the time. When it comes to geography and environment, uh, there was a lot of important stuff that went on, but really the most important thing to take note of uh, is the Federal Highway Act of 1956. This is going to allow for easier transcontinental travel and trade. So you can see what these highways would look like with the cars in the 1950s on the left, and then a map of what was known as the National System of Interstate and Defense Highways that spread throughout the United States. When it comes to politics and power, this is another big one. Well, the Red Scare that I mentioned earlier with under belief systems, uh, locally in the United States when it comes to politics, you had groups like the House Un-American Activities Committee that investigated the government and elected officials and bureaucrats, uh, seeing if they were truly loyal to America or if they might be communist spies. Um, employees in the government and even folks like teachers and police officers were forced were required to take loyalty oaths for their jobs to swear allegiance to the United States. Uh, there was something known as McCarthyism when Senator Joseph McCarthy held hearings in Congress uh, investigating the influence of communists uh, in the United States government. Uh, he even tried to investigate the army but eventually that led to his downfall. Uh, you had groups like the National Security Council who promoted things uh, who promoted the uh, expansion of the military budget uh, and to try and limit the influence of communism throughout the world through papers like the NSC-68. 
Also, you had the development of the hydrogen bomb. The United States was the first country to develop a hydrogen bomb, as pictured in the bottom right corner. Uh, and this was this well surpassed the atomic bomb as the most powerful uh, weapon in the world. You also had the rise of uh, Southern power during this time. A group known as the Dixiecrats, Dixiecrats tried to reassert their control, um, not just of politics in the South, uh, but over politics of the nation as a whole. And there's going to be a lot more resistance to this, though, uh, with the rise of what we consider the modern civil rights movement. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education, that Supreme Court decision that desegregated schools and eventually public facilities. You also have the uh, Montgomery bus boycott, where Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King, rose to prominence uh, and showed that nonviolent protest could be effective um, in desegregating uh, one of the most segregated cities in the country, or at least desegregating the buses. You had the rise of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the SNCC, uh, as well as other civil rights groups during this time. And you have uh, an attempt to continue the policies of the New Deal under what President Harry Truman called the Fair Deal his attempt to strengthen and extend the New Deal. It, it fails in many ways, but in some ways it does succeed in continuing uh, to, uh, to fund and to expand <clears throat> certain programs like Social Security. Um, with identity, uh, several important things to remember. First of all, white flight. Uh, so we're going to see the growth of suburbs, uh, but most of the people who head to the suburbs are white. Uh, a lot of blacks, a lot of Latinos. Even those who had the money uh, to live in the suburbs, to buy those houses and, and to buy cars that would allow them to drive from the suburbs to the cities for work, they're stuck in the cities because of discriminatory and racist housing policies. During this time, we're also going to see what's known as the baby boom. There's a record birth rate post-war as soldiers return home from the war front and want to start families and settle down. Um, you also see uh, a, a new version of feminism arise in the 1950s, thanks in part to a book known as The Feminine Mystique, a book which questioned and challenged uh, women's traditional roles, uh, just as caretakers of the home. When it comes to peopling, uh, as mentioned earlier, you had the growth of the suburbs, growth of areas like the Sun Belt, which is the southern United States all the way out to southern California. Uh, and in these suburbs and in these towns, you had the growth of what were known as Levitt towns, where you had a lot of suburbs with houses that looked almost identical to each other. Um, standard two-car garage, uh, two bedrooms, kitchen, dining room, and such uh, that you see in sitcoms of, say, the 1950s. You also had a pushback to immigration. Uh, just like there was a pushback to immigration after World War I. Uh, in this case, uh, one of the operations um, that targeted Latino, particularly Mexican immigrants, was known as Operation Wetback. Uh, yes, I know that is not a, a, it is a hostile term, um, but this is the actual name of the government operation, Operation Wetback. Uh, and this kind of channeled this hostility towards immigrants, uh, even immigrants who had been welcomed to the United States during World War II to help with production for the war. When it comes to the last category, economy and technology, we're going to see a lot of big changes uh, in the United States. Thanks in large part to the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, or the GI Bill. This is something still in effect today, and it's introduced right towards the end of World War II, and it offers new opportunities to veterans. As the sign in the upper right corner says, uh, veterans were able to uh, get government loans to buy a farm, to buy a home, to start a business, as well as take out loans to go to college. Uh, so people who serve in the military today uh, have a chance to make take advantage of the GI Bill in today's forms. Um, there is a brief recession after the war that's followed by strong, sustained growth in the 1950s. Uh, this growth uh, came about for several reasons that we'll get to in a second. Um, the growth of organized labor is going to slow, and they try to organize more in the South but fail uh, because of disinterest and also hostility by businesses. And during this time period, you're going to see, see an increase in white-collar uh, over blue-collar jobs. Blue-collar jobs are more manual labor, but instead you're going to see jobs like white-collar jobs uh, that require more education and not as much hand-to-hand uh, -hand labor. You're also going to see uh, access to easy credit, much like in the 1920s. This is going to increase the buying power of, uh, of people, of, uh, of Americans. Uh, things like the credit card are introduced. And the first credit card is the Diners Club card, as pictured here in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, of course, today, 
you know, credit cards seem like it's, it seems like everybody can get a hold of one. But this was a new thing in the 1950s. And people actually would use this credit because they had good wages. Uh, Americans were producing for large, uh, producing goods for a large chunk of the world uh, and felt very secure and confident in the future. And they were willing to take out loans. Well, thanks for watching, Bagpipe. We'll discuss these more in class. Uh, and feel free to watch back over this and bring any questions you may have about certain topics or terms or people that were mentioned.